Welcome to In The Room, where we explore the elusive world of casting for film, TV, and commercials. Join us as we interview directors, writers, producers, and actors, taking a deep dive into their experiences with casting and how the ultimate decisions are made in bringing a story to the screen. Get an inside look at casting and find out what really goes on in the room. Christmas wasn't the same without you. I'm really glad you made it back this year. You left home just as soon as you could. You couldn't have left any faster. You don't even talk to your own family anymore. So stop telling me what I should do. I spoke with Carly, and I think she's still on the market. So then why did you call me today? Why are we doing this? All right. <laughs> Let's just start. Um, I don't know how the first thing to say. Welcome to... Yeah, welcome to In the Room with Yen. Okay. Welcome to In the Room. Today we're here with Yen Tan. He is a Malaysian-born... Hold on, let me try that again. Yen Tan is a Malaysian-born writer, director, and graphic artist. He premiered the critically acclaimed Pit Stop at Sundance 2013. It was nominated for a John Cassavetes Award at the 2014 Film Independent Spirit Awards. Yen also co-directed Until We Could with David Lowry, an Addy-winning PSA for Freedom to Marry that was narrated by Robin Wright and Ben Foster. His New York Times Critics Pick feature, 1985, which we'll be talking about today, premiered at South by Southwest 2018 and was inspired by his short of the week of the same title. Yen has been a fellow of Austin Film Society's Artist Intensive, IFP's Film Week, and Film Independence Fast Track. He was in Out Magazine's Out 100 of 2018. He's based in Austin, where he also works as an award-winning key art designer for independent films and documentaries. Hi. Hi. Welcome, Yen. Hi, Heather. <laughs> that was really good. The intro was really good. Thanks, <laughs> John was, Williams. Yeah, My was. name is Heather Kafka. I am an actor, which is why I'm wearing a turtleneck um, <laughs> in <laughs> May of, yeah. in Texas. Yeah. Um, and this is my name is John Williams. I am a casting director. I, I run a company called The Cast Station with Carmen Leach. And you are? I'm Kendra Franklin. I'm also an actor and the casting assistant for The Cast yes. Station with John Williams and Carmen Leach. And we've brought Yen in to talk about 1985, and we want to talk to him about his uh, specifically uh, his casting process. But let's get to know him a little bit before that. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Where should we start? Where should we start? Where did you start? How did this all start? How old were you? Where were you living? Uh, you mean talking about film process? I'm talking about like when Yen yeah. decided that Yen felt like. I want to write movies, or I oh, want to tell stories. Oh my gosh. Or... I'm gonna to try to do a really abbreviated version of it. Uh, I mean, I think I think interest in film started at a very young age. You know, I think I was one of those kids that my parents would always say. You know, it was really weird that we would take him to the movie theater at the age of five or six, and he's one of those kids who can be quiet through movies. As opposed to other kids, I guess they get bored, or for whatever reasons, I was always fixated on what's happening, and I, you know, I always just love love going to the cinema with my with my parents, and then I think I think the interest sort of maybe it already started back then, you know. I mean, I didn't I didn't think about this idea of like that you can be a filmmaker because this was not part of you know the culture in in Malaysia, you know. I mean, I think. I think parents usually raise their kids with the idea that they're gonna go into uh, conventional careers, you know, and, and that is mostly like science and math oriented, you know. So you're gonna be an engineer or a doctor or an accountant and so forth. And what were these movies you were watching? Were they American films? I mean, uh, there was a lot of American films, but it's just all a lot of like Asian films also. But I think American films at that time was the most impactful for me. Uh, I mean, I think it was on only until I was 16 years old, and I think when I saw 
Delmon and Louise for the first time, that's when it was like, oh, like, you know, there is such a thing as directing and writing and stuff. And that film was probably the most significant for me and, and, and sort of made me realizing that, oh, maybe there is such a thing as like, you can actually tell stories on the screen and stuff. And so I looked into that at that time. I remember, you know, just like studying like really Scott, the director, and getting an understanding of his career at that time, at that age. And then I was like, oh, I could go to film school and all that kind of stuff. But then at the same time, you know, also like being in Malaysia, it was like going to film school in another country was such a far fetch concept. Like, Yeah, was anyone else I, doing that? I mean, no. <clears throat> no, I mean, the closest, I just remember that at that time, the closest comp for me at that time was like looking at Ang Lee and then realizing that's what he did. He went from Taiwan to to America and he, he studied in film school in America. And then I was like, oh, maybe that's the way to, to get in. I remember having a conversation with my parents after I graduated from high school and they were just kind of like, well, what are you going to do when you come back with a film degree? You can't get a job in Malaysia. There's barely a film industry in Malaysia, you know, so... So, I mean, thankfully, they were kind of understanding enough that they quickly accepted that I was just so bad in science and math that <laughs> they weren't the type of parents who would, like, force me into it. It's like, well, too bad. You kind of have to figure that out. They were just more like, okay, let's figure out something that you're actually into and you can actually still get a job, like, after you graduate from college. And and my mom was wise enough to sort of know that it's such a thing as mass communication, <laughs> So it was kind of like, oh, what if, uh, you know, that's like broadcasting, that's like camera stuff too. And, you know, like advertising is also kind of creative. So maybe you can like get into that. So I, 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 I went to Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, and I studied, I was an advertising major. I went to the, the School of Journalism at Drake. And so at that time, it was like advertising was like, oh, so, you know, if you like get into advertising, you can like get into the commercials world, which is like creative. Right. <laughs> and also, you know, making stuff like cameras and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so so at that time, I was like, OK, maybe that's a way to do it. And then so I graduated from Drake. And then the first job I got was at, a, at an agency in Dallas. And so I basically was in the advertising copywriting world for like. A decade and I just really hated it <laughs> very quickly because it was just kind of like you know I mean it was basically another version of like a soul-sucking corporate sort of gig where there was always the joke about like think outside the box and then like it never really happens <laughs> Get you know right everyone, in the box. at the end of it the, the, the people who decide what what should be made is always like ideas that you don't really get to think outside the box. Can this look more like a box, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, essentially, but, yeah. But not a box. Right, not a box. Right, but like different. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, and, and at, at that time, I, I, you know, when I was in Dallas and 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 I, I, I nights and weekends, I started looking into like, like uh, filmmaking because at that time, uh, you know, digital video was like coming into the picture and it's like you can just buy a camera and shoot your own stuff. Um, and I sort of like self-taught, you know, um, just like making films and sort of editing on your computer and stuff. And it was around the time that I met, you know, people like David Lowry and James Johnson. And we all just sort of became friends really quickly. And, you know, we worked on each other's films. And So when you were at the ad agency, mm -hmm. had you had you written anything yet of like your own or any sort of stories that were itching to come out? Did you um, already have that? I mean, it was all like shorts and just like attempts at writing features that were not finished, finished mm -hmm. scripts, you know? It was just, it was all of experimenting and just figuring out how to, especially make the, make it as a short form because at that time, that was the most affordable way of sort of like doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, making a feature was just seemed so hard, you know, because I think it costs so much money and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I mean, a good thing about about being friends with those those guys at that time is that we were kind of, learning from each other and we were learning together you know and i think we none of us came from sort of like formalized training background so there was just a lot of watching movies and listening to 
you know, director's commentaries on DVD and sort of learning in that way. And, and I think even at that time, I never thought of it as a viable career. You know, that was like, oh, you can be a film director full time and that kind of stuff. And it wasn't until our sort of like short films started getting to festivals that, you know, once I sort of went out into festivals and met other people, that's when this idea of like it being a, an actual profession was like possible, you know. But I would say, you know, I mean, even even then it was still kind of like a process, you know, because I mean, you go to festivals for short films and then you go to festivals for features. And then for me, I, I don't think it even dawned upon me that it was like a real thing until until I got into Sundance with Pit Stop in 2013, you know. And that was when it was kind of like you actually felt like you were made in the big mm. league and then you were just like meeting a lot of people who were just like doing really exciting things. But then for me also, it was still like, I mean, it's just weird that I fast forward to today in 2023 and I still don't think it's a viable career. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I guess I'm kind of doing it, but like, is it a full-time job? No, like yeah. not for me. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just, it's all the process. And, and I think it's interesting to just sort of look at how like, you know, like a lot of my peers are like have moved on to like bigger and better things. And it's really interesting to see where they're at and also sort of think about like, what did I do differently? Or, or how, how, I mean, you know, there's like a, a lot of layers to unpack there, you know, where it's a combination of like, I think when back in 2013, the sort of like the conversations about being like a director from an, underrepresented background and trying to tell queer stories in 2013 was still very much like, oh yeah, if you don't want a career in this, then you shouldn't be doing any of this and you shouldn't be a queer Asian American director doing any of this. You know, it's like, it's like, it was all of those things that made it a bit harder for people to see me at that time as like, oh, let's like give him an opportunity to do bigger things. You know, 2013 was like, I want to say it was still a few years away from the larger conversation of just like women and minorities in, in, in Hollywood and, and the representation of that. So I think, I think I was just kind of like, I was just like, not, I was, when, when I was, when I was at Sundance in 2020, 2013, the temperature in the room wasn't quite receptive to that kind of conversation yet. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, I miss out quite a bit, you know, I just like felt like, okay, I, I, I can't, you know, th this is just the way the business is and there's not much I can do about it other than I can still keep making stuff if I wanted to on the side. But you kind of doubled down on it. I mean, you went and did 1985, which right. was mm -hmm. like, you knew that information. <laughs> and you're like... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think and in a sense, you know, I made 1985 as a short film and I made 1985 as a feature in around 26, 2016, 2017. And that was a way to just sort of like, well, you know, if nothing else, even if Hollywood is saying that we don't want someone like you, I can still go back to the roots of like, well, you can still do, make your own films and make your films with like your friends and stuff. You know, there was, the yes. idea of that DIYness was still very much like, I didn't feel helpless in other words. I felt like I could still do that. Yeah. So like, and I know we are trying, we have a structure or whatever, mm -hmm. but I, I want to stay with this because would you say then that Pit Stop sort of, Get, did give you a boost and validate you in a way that did you get representation and then did yeah. you did you see did you have a path to make the next film or was it just sort of this ride that sort of fell off and then yeah. you were like well I still want to make a thing and so I'm gonna make a thing like was this still very indie or did you yeah. have like money and representation behind it that was also affecting its outcome yeah I should note that Hedo was also in Pit Stop. <laughs> yes. Thanks for the job, Yen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, representation definitely didn't happen then because, again, it was like the same idea of like nobody wanted to represent me because I can't get jobs, you know. Uh, so, so I mean, I remember, you know, like the, the film was nominated for a Spirit Award in 2014. So you think about like like any, any filmmakers who premiered their film at Sundance, and the following year that they get nominated for a Spirit Award, it would have been like a really big deal. You know, it would have been kind of in some ways life changing for a lot of people. But I just remember going to the Spirits Awards at 2014 and I just felt like I was a total piece of shit. Like, 
you're not the only one. I was like, yeah, I know. There's like I a think, lot of people yeah. having different versions of that, and yeah. I think I think it's not necessarily like it's not like a it's not personal in a way, you know. But I think a lot of people went through different versions of that, and I just remember, oh my gosh, I'm like at this thing, and like Kate Blanchett for you know is like a table away in front of me, and I was like, I'm a piece of shit. You know, like that <laughs> but, was like a really interesting. Sort but of why, why, why did you have that thought? Like, right because here. I felt like a lot of my peers were already moving ahead. Like people I went to Sundance with. You know, like David was like at Sundance for the first time the same year as I was with his movie, and I felt like a lot of my peers were like making progress. So you had like the imposter I, syndrome yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, I and feel I, like that happens for actors yeah, a yeah, lot. Yeah. Too, as I'm listening, like, I'm like, it's so it, it's like the parallel yeah, right? here, yeah. and I think it's just it's more fascinating. Or less like a creative like, person. Yeah, period. because right, I right, also right. was at a Sundance, you know, and had like yeah. a big chance, and right. then we were also at a Spirit Awards, and then we lost, and then you you still watch people, other people have momentum, yeah, right, you know, right. even as mm -hmm. actors, it's yeah. like, well, Renee Zellweger was in a chainsaw, and then she went. Ooh, right, and then right. I was in a chainsaw. And <laughs> right, I did it. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think you know this idea of like you don't want to compare yourself. But right, right. It's it's the most human nature thing to do in a way. So it's like yeah, of course you're gonna make yourself miserable, but at the same time, like crap, like a dozen of my friends are like moving ahead already, whether they're mm -hmm. like doing bigger things in film or TV, and you just feel like this sense of like being left behind, and then you're always coming to terms of this sense of like. Am I a piece of shit or is it just I'm just terribly, terribly unlucky? Or did you think that because of the subject matter and the type of film you made, you weren't getting those same opportunities that you're facing sort of like the industry didn't want to touch you or didn't want to give you those same opportunities? Or did you have the opportunities yeah. and said no, because I want to make the films I, I mean, want to I, make? I think it's the former scenario, you know, what you said, which is, I mean, 2013, 2014 was not that, that, that. Friendly environment. It, it was yeah. not, totally it was not. You know, this was still like, years away from me too and years away from this conversation of like what does it mean to to not be like you know a cis white guy in hollywood you know i mean that was not even discussed or examined at all at that time so i think i think you know honestly it was just kind of like yeah that was it was like really hard for someone like me to make it to break through at all but i think also is not even just comparing ourselves whether i'm a piece of shit or what it's mm -hmm. that we want it to make sense. Yeah. We're trying to make sense of a life and we're trying right. to make a career. And so we want it to sort of be like, well, if I go to film school and I do this and then, 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 then you know, and by the time I get to Sundance yeah. and then it's like, you're always trying to find that level of validation where you've made it and now mm -hmm. you can just be the thing right. instead of always trying to get in the door. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's hard too because you just feel like it's just going to keep going up and up and up and up. Yeah. Wait, well, it's not that simple. Right, right. Yeah. It's, not, it's not. Or maybe yeah. it doesn't go up and up and up, but it goes up, up. and then down yeah. and then yeah. level and right. then whatever. But that doesn't always equate on a timeline as far as like becoming an adult. Yeah. Like it yeah. seems to for other people who have jobs where they go to school for it, right. they get right. their degree and then they work the job. Yeah. So it gets like. I mean, it can take a toll on your psyche for sure. As yeah, you yeah, called no, yourself totally. a piece of shit many for times, sure. and yeah. you are far from a piece of <laughs> shit, yeah, my yeah. friend. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of like the things that we sort of do to ourselves, and the kind of conversations we have with ourselves. That it's it's very much like a roller coaster. You know, I mean, I mean to be fair, you know, it's like a lot of my even like my uh, peers who fit the profile. You know, like like cis white guys. I mean. A lot of them didn't make it either. You know, they had they right. went through their own versions of roller coaster. So it's it's very much like not it's not everyone has a different journey, honestly. You know, it's like and there's no more way of telling if you're gonna be. The I chosen say that one. all the time. I, <laughs> I I have actors say, "What's the secret?" Yeah. I'm like, one, if I knew the secret, I'm not telling you, right? Because right. then I'm gonna be on the cover of People, right? 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 <laughs> and I go too. It's just everyone has their own journey. Yeah. It's yeah. just different. I don't. I cannot. Figure out why this happens for this guy doesn't right. happen for this guy. Right, right. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. But, I mean, I commend you for have, ha having that, facing all that, and then going back to the table and saying, I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm yeah. Gonna not only am I going to make 1985, but I'm going to make it in black and white. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to make it about like, a subject matter that I'm nobody... Gonna it, and I'm going to shoot it on film, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. No, totally. So we want to yeah. talk about you being a sadomasochist, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think totally. that's really what's happening here. I mean, I think in, in some ways, mentally, I think that's where I was at, making both the short film and the feature of 1985, where I think I think mentally I was definitely sort of... Uh, I, would, I don't want to say not at a good place, but it was a sense of like... I felt really bleak, I would say, you know, about just the prospects of everything. And making those those two films was a way to sort of 
step outside of myself, you know, just like, okay, like just, just get over yourself a little bit and just think about something, a story that is like meaningful to you and just sort of be in someone else's shoes for a while and then see how their journeys unfold and see if, if by unfolding their journeys, you can get any insight for yourself. And I think making both the short film and the feature was a way to sort of, to sort of do that, you know, where it's just kind of like, just process it through art, you know, process it through somebody else's story, you know, and see how you feel about yourself afterwards. So when you started honing in on this specific story, mm -hmm. did you, did you have that thing where did certain people come to mind to fill these characters? Yeah, roles? yeah. I mean, did you write anything specifically for someone? I, I mean, at, um, I mean, I think you mean you mean like talent wise, mm -hmm. you're right. I mean, no, no, you know, because I think I think at that time, the short film was, you know, you can cast whatever, whoever, you know. We could we just like looked at auditions. And say, just, say why that is though. Why why do you feel like you can just cast whoever? Because whoever? because the short film was only like something that was like financed through a combination of. Um, equity from friends and grants, so it was there was no pressure in like you have to cast someone of note, you know. So we can just sort of get auditions and just like L Lindsay Pulsifer was a friend, and we just reach, reach out to her and see if you wanted to do this part. So that was like easier to sort of make. In and that. you knew that at that point, yeah. From did you know that from doing pit stop and trying to to get pit stop sold, or did you know that? How did you just because um, you talked for your friends, you knew that financing plays a, a big key. I mean. I, I think I knew that, but I also knew not for short films and not for like something like Pit Stop where it was still very small, the mm -hmm. project, and it didn't have that kind of pressure where you have to cast someone of note, you know? But then when we made the feature, that was definitely a thing, you know, because, you know, even though the budget that we had in mind for 1985 wasn't a lot, but, you know, the people we were working with, the people who were putting money into it had quite a bit to say in terms of what kind of actors we should be casting. Mm. So 1985, the feature was very much like the casting was happening in a way where we had to compile a list and get a proof for those lists of names and sort of go down the list of who we go out to. So do you think when you went from the short to the feature, mm -hmm. did you lose some sort of control in the casting process? I would say losing control in the sense that you cannot audition anyone. There was no sense of discovering who's right for it. It was all like you go out to someone, if they respond to the script, you have a, at that time, we just have a Skype conversation with them. And then you see how you feel about each other. And it was very much like dating in that way. Okay, just, wait, I want to hone in on yeah. that. So like... Was there no, did you know there was just no possibility that you could take the actors from the short and plug them into the feature? No. You knew Zero. that yeah. there was no possibility Zero. that that would Unl be it. Yeah, it was like no possibility. And if we wanted to get cut some level of financing, you must go for names. And that is because they believe that names will put butts in seats and yes. then they will make their money back. Right. That's exactly. the business part yeah. of show business. Right. And right. that's still very much a model that is, you think. Yeah. And even at that point, it was still a little bit of like, not as bad at that time, but this idea of whether it's a name, it's someone that 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 people know who they are if they're on a TV show or a film and so forth. And even that was just like uh, I think at that time it was just that just becoming a factor, which is how many followers they have on social media was part of it. Like if you're someone, even if you're then, and you think then in nineteen eighty five, yeah, it came out. It definitely came out. Wow. Yeah. So I mean, it's not like it's not like we cast marquee names. You know, I mean, some of the names are obviously some people know, but it's not like it's not like they were like huge ass names either. You know. So t walk us through the process when you go to create those lists for them to approve. Like, yeah. what wh what was your thought process? I mean, at that time, it was like, I mean, coming up with names is definitely fun. You know, it's just kind of, oh, wouldn't it be great to get this person or that person? And these I always, always say, I always say, I can play this game all day if you right, guys want right. to. Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know? 
And it's like the 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 realistic of getting those people is obviously a question because just because you think so and so is great for it and you go out to them with an offer doesn't mean they're going to take it because first they're going to making they're making scale on your project so financially it's not enticing. Secondly, you're making in their minds a really small film, you know, an indie about a subject that is not necessarily everyone's comfortable. Exactly. With. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like it's just like. So your list starts to get smaller. <laughs> your list gets smaller very quickly because you sort of realize you cannot go out to a certain level of actors, even though the financing people are saying that you should. Did go you have out to, to learn them. that, or did you kind of understand that? I I learned and understood at the same time. You know, I think I think as it was just this this very general idea of like you know it's a business, so people have to make the business decisions when it comes to this. So I knew that I have to work within the parameters of like okay. Let's think about people who are creatively ripe for this parts and just sort of go down the list in that way, you know. Uh, and I would say at that time, like with 1985, it was it was oddly not super challenging just because, I mean, between, um, you know, producers I, I knew and also friends who have worked with other actors, it was a it was kind of easy, not easy, but it was it was like. The whole thing was like the thing I also knew at that time was like if you can just bypass the reps, that will be the back, best. if you can get in the back door. Right. Yeah. If you can get to the back door without going through the agents and managers, that would be the best way to go go. The about actors, it. agents and managers? Yeah. Because they get excited about the material. Because and they can influence their well, well, yeah, but also agents and managers cannot well, I'm saying that it's better to not go through the agents and right. managers because right. because they can just sort of shut it down even before the actors are aware of it. Especially mm. for a that small That literally offer. happened to me yeah. with Lovers of Hate. It happens to literally a lot of people. Happened. Yeah. And it was just because the breakdown said nudity was mm -hmm. required. Right. And he was like, I know Heather, she's never going to do that. Right. Right. But in my mind, what maybe he didn't know was right. I was always like, well, no, it really depends. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Exactly. It really depends. Because back then still it was like, you know, something that was like a B movie or whatever. Yeah. You know, local mm -hmm. doing nudity or whatever. Right. Right. It's like... Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. It was like red flags. Yeah, yeah, yeah total red flags. But he didn't, I, I hadn't even seen the material. Right, right. Before I found out later from the director yeah. that he had been told no right. multiple times yeah. before I became aware of it. Yeah. And the reason for this is that you feel that the actor can then go to his team and influence them and say, I want to do this. If they fall in love with the material, then they kind of overwrite everyone, you know, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I mean... I think, you know, it's it's always possible, even at that time, even if they fall in love with the material, their team can say, don't do this because it's small. I've had that. You know, so so I think, yeah, I think it really depends, you know, on like, how that plays out. But in the case of 1985, I think it played out in the most sort of organic way where it was just like, you know, at that time, it was kind of like, you know, Corey Michael Smith was someone I knew his work who played the lead in 1985. And he was in a really popular TV show at that time called Gotham. And I think, you know, like Michael Chiklis was on Gotham too. So Corey knew Michael very well. And it was just like getting Corey to reach out to Michael for us, you know, was like, oh. And then Ash Christian, uh, who, who who's passed away, was uh, our producer. And he knew Virginia Madsen because they used to live in the same condo in L.A. <laughs> And they, they used to hang out at that time. And it was like, oh, I can just pass this along to Virginia and see if she wants to do it. And, you know, and then Jamie Chunk was also someone, I'm trying to remember how we got to her, but I, I think I know one of the directors who's worked with her before and just reach out to the director to just give her a heads up sort of thing. But it was just kind of like that kind of stuff. We just like did you hobbled have together Did you have pressure to, to get names in all the roles or were they just like, we just need two names um, or we need? I mean, I think it was still like, you have to get it for as many parts as possible. So it was like, I don't think I was given a number, but I definitely felt this sense of like, like at least for the main names all have, the main characters all have to be sort of names, you know, at that time. And and so, so thankfully- So you're really limited to like your network of <coughs> who you know and how you can get to people. At that level, at I that think. Level, yeah, 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 totally, yeah. totally. Yeah. My cousin works at McDonald's who yeah. waited on his grandmother who knows her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, because I think, too, for it, it is 
it does kind of sometimes come down to a relationship mm -hmm. of like, you know, if I'm Virginia Madsen and I like the material, but I'm not sure it's not paying, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not really sure how they're going to handle it if they're real amateur or whatever, yeah. that then when you meet a person or you speak on the phone with a director and you hear the vision or you you can tell what level of professionalism mm -hmm. they have and all that kind of stuff. So then it really sort of does become, well, am I going to enjoy working this, with these people, yeah. spending time with these people? Do I love this role? Is the message enough? Or like all of yeah. those elements as opposed yeah. to just a business transaction. Yeah, no, no, no for, for, for sure. And I, I feel like I feel like the Skype conversations with those actors uh, were were very indicative of that, you know, of just this sense of like, do we actually connect as people first and foremost, and can we sort of see ourselves working together? Because I think that 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 first conversation is very much like it gives you a sense of how that person is, and whether this is gonna be uh, like compatible in a way, you know, as a as a working relationship. And I feel like I feel like I I, I think I have I I I mean I I'm I'm lucky that I have very sort of good instincts about whether whether these are people you should work with sort of thing you know and and I think I think that really helped me inform like if if I should be casting these people if they're actually right for the movie and and so forth did you have others that you spoke we don't have to say names but did you have others that you're like I, w I wasn't feeling it or yes yeah. and then there was a point where I, I spoke to someone who was a name at that time and for the for the lead part who was like not right for the part, but he was definitely like someone that the financing company was like, oh yes, this is like, you, you just have to get him alone. You have to, you don't have to worry about the other parts, but if you get him as the lead, then it's definitely a green light. And and I just remember talking to this person on Skype and I was like, oh my gosh, he's so wrong for this. <laughs> and And feeling like, okay, should I just, figure it out anyway, even if he's wrong for it, mm -hmm. you know? And that was a part of me I was like, oh, maybe I could compromise. And thankfully that actor passed very fast before I had to go mm -hmm. down, mm -hmm. you know, the 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 road. Um, and I was like, oh gosh, that was like a blessing in disguise mm -hmm. that like he passed mm -hmm. after he talked to me, yeah. Do you feel that there is sort of a magic of the right person finding the right, the right part? Like it, mm -hmm. it, it there's like sort of a, uh, like you said, like the financing would be like, if you can get this yeah. guy, but do you feel like it was sort of a little bit of magic, a little bit of creative magic in there? Or? You know, people, I always hear like sometimes directors would talk about like, I wrote this for this person and nobody else. And I'm like, you know what? I think you're very privileged to be able to say that. To say, I wrote something for someone and I got that person. Like, that's a very privileged thing to say because... I don't, I don't believe in that because I've, I'm kind of like, you kind of have to be, I don't think that even with the people I cast, as much as I, I loved them and thought they were right for it, they were the only people for that part. I that's think that's at least, that's at least, probably, that's probably at least a dozen people who's great for that part, who's going to do their versions of it and they're going to be right for it. It's not, I don't think it's completely locked down, you know, in other words, it's like everyone has their own interpretation of it mm -hmm. and not all interpretations are like that's not just one version of this part. In that's other words, that's very giving yeah. and fascinating <laughs> for a writer director, yeah. I would think, because yeah. it comes out of you. You have such a an attachment that uh -huh. I I would find it like I would have found it difficult just leaving the the short film actors that I had cast yeah, and, yeah. and making mm -hmm. putting different people in those roles. Yeah, I, yeah, that yeah. would. But maybe is it because you've you're maybe more attached to the story that you're telling, the overall, like you're doing your ultimate service mm -hmm. to the story. I guess. <laughs> I mean, was there yeah. were, were there any actors that you that stood out? Because you're saying that there was more, but were there any that were like, I know this is the person, mm -hmm. and you got that, per or you weren't able to get that person? Um. I remember I remember when I spoke to Corey at that time, I felt like he was and at his body of work at that time made me realize that he was kind of very right for the movie, you know, and and so I think I was I, I mean, we were lucky with him in that sense, even though there was there was a period of time I remember when we wanted him to do it. 
and we just couldn't work with his 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 TV schedule at that time, and he had to pass because he was just kind of I want to do the movie, but if you're gonna shoot it in this time period, I just can't do it. And and thankfully, the schedule ultimately worked out in a way where we could shoot when he's done with the show, you know, and then that worked out, you know, like where it's like oh yeah, he was kind of like meant to be for for the movie. So wait, when that happened, mm-hmm. so he passes, right? Mm-hmm. So then, do you just start we just, moving like, went on? Down the list. Uh-huh. We just went down the list and then figure out who we should and go And started to. offering other people, or you mm-hmm. didn't even get to that point yet. You did. I start. mean, we started offering to other people, and then it was just basically like we couldn't get anyone else. <laughs> so once you couldn't get anyone else, the schedule get pushes down the line. Mm. You know, then it's like then it's like you have to get someone, and they're available, and then you work your schedule around their availability. Mm-hmm. And so since that never happened, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. your schedule was behind and right. pushed. And, and then so eventually then it, it worked out where, oh, Corey's like available. Who, who came and up then, with that? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I think I think his reps just told us that. It was just like, oh, have you guys started shooting? Oh. Um, and if you haven't, you know, he's still very interested That's in the I part. Say. I was going to wow. ask, was he still really interested? He was still okay. very interested. And I think, I think the, the fact that he and his team at that time was still sort of like looking into it. I have a feeling he was the one who did it. Meaning he probably was like, oh, have they started shooting yet? And is that role filled? If not, I would like to talk to them again. You know? But That's again, amazing. this was this right, was all informed right. <laughs> because because we connected on our first Skype conversation. Right. You know, where it was like he responded to material and he really liked me as a as a director, so it was just it kind of like worked out in that way. Did you just isolate that role, and you were, that was like the the one that you guys were focused on, and so you weren't even going after the other roles? Mm-hmm. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So once you locked him, mm-hmm. you started mm-hmm. like okay. the rest trickled down. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so in that sense, after that, the the rest of the casting kind of happened a lot faster. You know, there was a there was less sort of waiting. Did he green light funding? Did he and he green? Um he I want to say he didn't quite green light funding yet. I think it was still like we cast him, we still have to cast the other parts first and then see if we can get green lit. And then did you find that he helped a lot cuz he helped with Mike Michael, right? He got him mm-hmm. that yep. relationship so then it, yeah. and then Michael probably helped with every getting And then of- I think I think Ash reaching out to Virginia, Ash the producer and then and then I subsequently put together the whole Jamie Chung thing. Uh so it sort of happened in that so, way. So yeah. did, did you read for the kid? Did you read for uh, oh, so, Aiden? I mean, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the kid thing, initially, it was like, because I'm trying to remember how that happened. So I think at that time, we actually were supposed to get one of the Stranger Things kid. Mm. And 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 I don't want to like just like bring up names anymore and that kind of stuff. But if you look around, like, you can actually find the um, the Deadline article about who was originally attached to play the kid. But, um, and the kid wanted to do it. One of the Stranger Things kid wanted to do it. And Stranger Things, the schedule got pushed because someone someone broke their leg or something in, in the middle of the shoot and they have to like delay the schedule. And it, it just like overlap into a production schedule and we had to, you know, the kid can't work on our film so we have to audition kids. Mm-hmm. But at that time, it was like the financing people were not like, the child actor is a determinant factor mm-hmm. because I think, which I think, it rarely is, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So unless I mean, probably like there's a zero point five percent of child actors who could get something greenlit. And but, I, and I find everybody wants to discover the new child actor. Let's search right. the country and find yeah. the new. Exactly. Yeah. The new Macaulay Culkin or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at that time we auditioned kids locally in 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 Dallas Fort Worth area. And and that was really fun because I felt like, oh, this is to actually audition them in person at that time pre COVID was was very fun because you actually get to interact with them. So did you have a casting director up until that point or uh no. I mean we had a casting director who was sort of working with us for like maybe the first two months and then sort of realized how challenging it is to cast a project and just sort of left our project. Wait, and how challenging? Just because I think there was this sense of like he came on board because he thought the script was like easy to get people 
And then once he sort of engaged with talents, he realized, oh shit, it's actually really hard. Mm. And it was like, and then he was like, he, quiet, like he was like, he yeah. was just like, quiet, <laughs> he just like <laughs> quietly left the room, sort of thing. Yeah. And, and retired. We were like, we were like, wait, do we still have a CD? What happened? He was like, no, you're on your own. Oh There's no God. money in this. What? And so I think. I mean, ask Christian. It's at also that hard time. for casting because representation will get mad at me yeah. if I go through the back door. Right, They're like, right. why are you calling mm -hmm. my yeah. client? Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so yeah. they're only left with like one lane, yeah. you know? And if that piece of paper doesn't have dollar signs on it, it's really hard to convince, like you said, representation to, yeah. take, to take it. So but did I, you get all of your leads without casting? Well, director? hold on a second. I kind of, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm like not, not laying this out all like chronologically, and it's kind of like coming back in. It's a long time ago, but yeah, because, and because we've had a pandemic. Casting director, who even though he like resigned or he left, he left the room. Um, it was because of his initial sort of sent getting feelers that we actually got Corey that way because. I remember at that time when he came on board, the, the CD was helping us cast. The whole thing was like, okay, let's see who's right for the lead part. And he just went out to all the agencies and stuff, right? And I just remember there was agencies who completely did not submit any actors for us to consider because it was just like, this is like, we're not going to fuck with this because it's too small. When you say all the agencies, do you mm -hmm. mean nationwide? Oh, I'm statewide? talking about like just like, the big agencies just okay. completely ignore it. So, for instance, I think at that time, the top dogs definitely ignore our submission or ignore our, our, our casting director in that they just didn't submit any names to us. And then the smaller ones are the ones who are more receptive. In other words, not the top three agencies. And then the other ones were just like, oh, you know, consider this batch of actors. And it was that that time that we we came across Corey as a submission because we I saw his reel and that time already knew his work. So I was like, oh, it would be great to get him. And and that's how the first Skype conversation with Corey started. So I would say that was probably more traditional in the sense that they came through submissions. And that's how I found out who this person is. Um, but the rest of the actors, we just sort of cast like, through, you know, going through the back doors. Except... Aiden. Except for... The kid. The kid was... I think Ash sort of did reach out to hit... Uh, I think Ash Christian was the one who sort of figured that out through another one of his um, connections to get to one of the Stranger Things kid. The kid who you ultimately cast, though. Oh, the kid we ultimately cast was through auditions. Right. right. Is that so the that only was... set of auditions you had? Correct. Correct. Yes. And yes. so you didn't read anything from any of the other nope. actors. Nope. Never saw them say a word of the script nope. before they were hired. until the day they arrive on the like, set. It's until just like cross fingers. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yep. How's that? Scary. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely scary, but I think, but I think that's also. Uh, I mean, you know, when you work when when you work with these like seasoned actors, they also. They're not gonna be bad or completely off, right? Because I think in my There's head, a level of trust. Yeah. There's a level of trust and there's a level of sense of like knowing that, okay, they'll be they'll be they'll be good in this, you know. You need to get them to the level you want them to be at, but they're not gonna start off being terrible. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Even though I've heard stories from other friends who start off from a terrible place. Yeah. You know, because they're pressured to cast people. Yeah. I know this guy's from Fort Worth, but I'm thinking about doing it with a Scottish accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And but you so talk a bit more about the audition process with because you probably did the pastor, the the grocer, yeah. like all those roles. Did you do that all at the same time? Uh yeah. And even then, we just cast friends at that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you did audition yeah. the 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 Aiden's role, uh -huh. the boy. Yeah. Okay. That was the only one. Yeah. Uh, okay. And if you had your like, if you could ma make it. The process, the, any way you wanted to, would you prefer that over having to just like make offers, or would you have liked to have read everybody? And do you audition. like the audition process? I I loved it. Yeah, I would prefer to audition every part. Yeah. What do you, you love know? about it? I mean, discovering is very fun, mm -hmm. and just sort of like, you know, you you kind of don't know who these people are in a way, so it's kind of like you want to see their version of how they do a role. Mm -hmm. And right. that's always fun in the sense that 
you know, some of them, you know, the, 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 how they surprise you can go either ways. It could be completely like, you know, off, you know, it's like, oh gosh, like how could anyone read that scene in that way <laughs> to people who read it and they completely elevate the material, you know? And I think when, when they surprise you by elevating the material, that's when you're kind of like, you really see the potential of the material even more. And, and I think that's, that's like magic in a way. And so when you say that, is that the actor coming in with his his uh, his his or her's own uh, view, own voice, own own mm -hmm. like like what I find a lot of times is like everyone reads it the same way, yeah, right? Right. Right. And so that magic that you talk about for an actor, what 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 would your advice be to them? I feel like I mean I I I, I this is like this sounds kind of like kind of like. Not, not to say snobby, but there is a hint of that sort of sense of like, I do believe in this idea that people who have generally a pretty good taste in culture, you know, whether it's cinema or music, is going to be a certain kind of person. The, the, the people who, 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 who read a lot of books or just people who are very well informed, you know, they're, they're like very intelligent artists in a way, you know, and... And so, you know, if you get a sense of like, oh, what they're into and stuff, later on, it kind of makes sense why why they're the way they are. When they come into a room and they read it and they, you feel like, oh, that was like really good or whatever, you know. And then you get to know them as people afterwards and you learn the kind of things they are into and it all makes sense. You're like, oh, that's why. Because... I don't want to, again, I don't want to be snobby or say, oh, because they have good taste. <laughs> like, it's a little bit more than that. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of having good taste and they know, like, they, 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 they come from a, an experience or a journey where it, it makes them the way they are. Right. You know, people who Absolutely. are sort of, like, come from right. really interesting backgrounds or whatever, you know. The different life experiences. Exactly. From Absolutely. Yeah, right. Sort of makes them the way they are. Absolutely. Yeah. I find in the room... Uh, directors will talk to mm -hmm. actors for a while yeah. and then we'll be discussing later and they're bringing up more of that conversation because yeah. I think mm -hmm. they can see the core of the person right. and they can see that that's what they want yeah. they can work with yeah. right as opposed to an idea that they brought it's yeah. like if I can find the human element in this person I think I can I can paint my picture better right yeah. right right. yeah I mean you, you hit on the right word John like core of a person is very much a thing you know and I think that that really informs the art performance maybe you can tell me if i'm wrong but i mm -hmm. feel like that's where i and us as actors have sort of been suffering mm -hmm. lately since we only have been casting off tapes yeah. um since the pandemic and whatnot mm -hmm. it's it's kind of become this what started out as a great thing because i could live in austin mm -hmm. and tape for things in la yeah. so i had more opportunity in that respect mm -hmm. right. now i feel like has actually kind of become like it's working against right, me, yeah, right, yeah. right. Because there's no exchange of energy in the room, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, I feel like um, there's an element of it feels more like throwing a dart at a board. Mm -hmm. In that, I have to literally try to give the person what they saw in their head mm -hmm. on screen in that moment, mm -hmm. because there isn't that element of getting to know a person where you're like, "Wow, that was totally." not what I wanted and mm -hmm. wrong for the thing, but I can tell that you're good. So mm -hmm. let's try it this way. Mm -hmm. Like there's none of that back Feedback, and forth right. in the relationship. Mm -hmm. yep. There's no exchange yeah. of like pheromones or anything mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know, but I really like him yeah. or, you know, uh, let's try more things. Yeah. Like that seems to be missing. Have you had to cast off of just tapes? Uh, I mean, I can't like, I, you know, I, I, I just, so I, I just finished shooting a movie, right? Yeah. That I, I can't really talk about much yet, but, but I think that process was very much like there was, there was parts that we just went out to actors and there were parts that we were casting through auditions through the help of a casting director in LA. And so for those parts, it was all just like watching videos, you know? It and was. I, you didn't have I, any in the room There was no auditions. in the room. And, and even the callbacks were still all virtuals, you know? And I have to say... It definitely does not help. I mean, it definitely has what all, everything you say is completely valid, just in the sense that the direct in-person thing is 
is helpful for sure. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like even in callbacks where I did interact Direct. with them, it's still like this virtual space of like... Totally. There's definitely a kind of a disconnect because... I'm because, still alone in my right, office right. with yeah. like junk over here in the corner. And this is not, like, this is not considering internet signals. Right. right. I mean, I had to do... There was one callbacks and the actor was in Asia. And we had to do it through her not great Wi-Fi signal in the hotel. Right. And it was all sort of like jittery in parts, yeah. you know? And so it's kind of like, is that going to hurt your audition? I mean, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. kind of. It does. It's like, it's nothing you can do about it, you right. know? But I would say, I would say, generally speaking, I think, I think in-person audition is still better, you know? Let me ask this question as far as casting goes. Do you, when you're when you're reading people or you're watching auditions, mm -hmm. do you have an idea of like that you're trying to match in your mind, or like, uh, are are you are you complete blank slate? Mm -hmm. Are you like, because I'm always I always feel like I'm looking for something and then I see it and mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's it. Yeah. Or do you are you just like are you able to just disassociate with it all? I mean, I I definitely have a certain sense of like, okay, this is the kind of actor that I see for the part well especially if you wrote off. it too right mm -hmm. like i think when you're writing you already have an idea yeah of some sort correct right. um and then trying to find the person to fit what you wrote right and then also being allowing yourself if you can to be open enough yeah to see different interpretations of what you've written mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then have to go from that to go okay let me cast this person um, or see how they decide to audition for mm -hmm. this part in the casting process right Right. Right. Like that's how I'm thinking about the process as an artist. I mean, from a thinking from an actor standpoint, writer, director into pre-production. Right. Mm -hmm, you got mm -hmm. all these different factors. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But like he was saying, like, are you OK? I wrote Adrian. Now I have to I'm trying to find Adrian. Mm -hmm. Or do you just have the character of Adrian and you're like, let's see who fits in best or like yeah. who? Try to break down how you make that decision. Like when you say that's the guy, that's the girl. So, okay. So I guess, okay, I, can, I, I should sort of break it up into sort of like a two-part thing for that question then because there's a version where you 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 get, you get you, you put out the offer and then you have that first conversation with them to see if you're compatible, to see if they're right for the part. And you have to cast by your your instincts about that conversation without them actually auditioning for it, right? So that one is very much like... Which I want to point out, yeah. everything's writing all these millions of dollars uh -huh. <laughs> on this person, yeah. and they're not even allowing you to like work with exactly. them. Exactly, yeah. because their reps it, won't let them read for it. Uh, yeah, which you know? is crazy, because it's like... Right, won't, they right, won't. I'm stroking a $5 million if check. You, if you put on an offer, it's 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 always like this this thing where they won't... The, the reps will not let them read for it because it's... It's something that's scale and it's indie. So you got to be like Paul Thomas Anderson to make them read for it. <clears throat> you know, you have to be a hot shit director. Otherwise, they're not going to put themselves on tape for it. Because the whole thing is like the, 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 the team is thinking that we are trying to protect our talents. Right. You have them at a level. Yeah. It's like when you win, it's like it kind of became tricky yeah. when independent film started to blow up again mm -hmm. with Quentin Tarantino and Pulp Fiction and all that stuff. And then we started, like John Travolta, yeah. right? You started having a big star in a low-budget indie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a thing where, you know, Marsha Gay Harden had just yeah. won an Oscar. Yeah. And her manager would tell me she's finding it very hard to get work for her now because yeah. she can't tarnish the level of Oscar right. by taking a really low paycheck exactly. to be exactly. in this indie film. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of probably like, like of, that on yeah, like a working a actor scale. Like, I mean, there's a combination of just like egos and not, not putting putting yourself down. You know, yeah, like so I much. think that's just sort of sense of like there's this perception that if you're if you're if you're being considered for a smaller film by by a director who's not known yet, you cannot, you shouldn't you shouldn't put yourselves out there in in a very vulnerable way. You right. shouldn't read for it, in other words, which sounds crazy, but mm -hmm. it's like reading for it. If you're going to make us read for it, it's like it's an offer. If you're right. going to make us consider the role, it's an offer. Otherwise, we're not even going to look at your script. It's kind of like 
the the hurdle we have to overcome. Right. Yeah. For that caliber of the. Well, right. reading right. for it essentially, yeah. like at up to a certain point, is you're 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 giving unpaid labor. Right. 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 You're making right. the actor work. Yeah. On their you know time off. Right. Uh, for no pay. Yeah. Just yeah. this opportunity, which is what we do all the right. time. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Not saying yeah, I want to yeah. do that right. forever, right. but that it's like there's like image around yeah. it when right. you, you know. And also, too, they're like, don't waste my time. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's a lot of that. Don't waste my time. Don't waste our time, basically. Right. That, that comes with. <laughs> and again, it's very much dictated by the kind of production you are. Are you big enough for us to, you know, to have an attitude about it? Right. You know? I'm like, that's a double sided yeah. coin thinking yeah. about how they started. They all had to start off the way w- in the position we're in. Like, we still audition. Mm hmm. And at some point, they transition to get a name where people are interested in them, but to not even a, I mean, I guess like you're saying, am I that big where I don't, I don't need to do this anymore? Right. I mean, I get it on one level. It's like, I earned my rights, right? I shouldn't right. have to do this. But on right. some level, right. it's like, push, I mean, I think even in every industry, right, we can be so good at something, but forget to humble ourselves and go back a little bit to like relearn. Because mm-hmm. I, I feel like on every lo- actor, director, right? Um, if we get so big that we forget where we come from, do we actually ever keep learning? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, also as an artist too, it's like I want to try on the clothes. I want to play with it. I want to see if this yeah. is right for me. It seems like there's yeah. an explore, exploration that as an actor, you want to like, yeah. I want to feel if this is the right, you know. if, if, if be Really be a part of right. this. Be and, this person and work in with, the story. Work, I feel work, that. Work, yeah. it's work big in enough. a dynamic with right. the director where we're talking the same language as mm-hmm. far as, you know, adjustments. Yeah. and Especially if it's a director you never worked with. And before. you're going to spend, you know, the next like, three months with the person and probably two years before the film get, gets out, you know, and yeah. you're going to be the face of it. It seems like, you know, I wouldn't want to buy a business unless I like got to know how that business was run and who's running it and mm-hmm. you know how it felt. Right, right. So, do you think that you didn't? Uh, did you get that leverage on the back of Sundance and Spirit Award noms, no. or what? So, no did way. you get that leverage <laughs> when you on I, the back of representation you then got? I mean, you mean getting getting the leverage of just like. The leverage of like, okay, so if it was your first film yeah. and it's like, hi, I'm Yen and Hutch yeah. and we have a script. Do right. you like it? Like how like <laughs> how you were obviously at a different level yeah. that you were able to go out to people with just offers. Right. So how were you guys able to be perceived differently in order to do that as opposed to I mean, it's it your probably, first time? I probably the leverage probably is... I mean, I honestly don't know, but there's a version of me that's like thinking that, oh, you know, the whole Sundance and Spirit Award definitely maybe put me in the front of the line in some ways that it's not, I'm just not like a first time potential hack. But I also know how the business is and I know the 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 close door conversation is probably freaking brutal and probably like, who the fuck is this guy? You yeah. Know? <laughs> and making a fucking AIDS drama, do we need that in the freaking 20... 20- 18 and it's like shot in black and white. What the fuck is he? <laughs> like I bet that's the kind of conversation that happens with with, with totally. the reps. Yeah. That it's totally harsh and shitty and and catty and whatever. You know. Yes. It's like, I, I I I don't even have to like. You know, oh, Corey yeah. likes it. No. <laughs> yeah, they're like Corey. What the fuck? We need to get you a bigger part. You have done the Todd Haynes movie and stuff. What are you trying to mess with this? Like it's probably there's probably a lot of that kind of shit happening. You know. And yeah. And I'm I'm kind of like. I get it. Again, I, I, none of this is personal because I'm like, that's not how that's how the business is. Like, yeah. like, did you think everyone's going to be pleasant and polite? No. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, and I mean, in that sense, it's kind of like it's kind of like you know, just whatever. You know, just like it's not personal. And, and in the meantime, you still have to try to get your film made. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because I think I, I, well, I'm I'm this is I guess a question. Like, is there ever a point where you're like, I know how the business works, but I still think this that I'm good enough for this mm-hmm. to actually happen. Right, right, And I right. need to push through anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. I mean, you know, this is like, um, you know, I, I like, you know, when, when I went to Sundance in 2013 and we went to that filmmaker's luncheon and, like, it was always, like, Robert Redford was giving this speech to all the directors in the room. And, and I was told, you know, I mean, it was the first time I heard that speech, but a lot of the directors who had been there, like, several times before – it was just like it's always the same speech, but I think it's always the same speech because I think what Robert said in the speech is actually completely true, which is like perseverance is everything, you know. And it's like you think about 
someone like Robert Redford saying that about his own journey, right? And I, you're like, like, aren't weren't doors all open to you for <laughs> most of your career? And the fact that you have to say that you still have to persevere and get things made is very telling because then you're like, okay, then the same rule applies for everyone else, you know? And then I feel like, you know, with 1985, it was very much like, you know, I, it, it wasn't like what I experienced with Pit Stop made me think, oh, well, I'm not going to make movies anymore. It's so, it's so hard. I still try to like make it on my own terms, you know, and try to push my projects through in that way. Did you feel like ultimately, despite all the setbacks and different things, mm -hmm. that you ultimately always got what you wanted for the film? Uh, I think so. I think so. In a way, you know, I think I, I feel like my expectations for 1985, the feature was even lower than what the film ended up being, you know, meaning I originally thought I was just going to make a film casting friends and so forth again and i was going to make it for way less than the intended budget and all that kind of stuff and and then you know i just remember at that time when when ash Christian came on board as a producer he was just kind of like you don't have to do that again you can actually think about making this a little bit bigger than pit stop you know and i i never thought of it as like wait you can actually do that i don't think that's available to me you know it was kind of like the feeling i had then and so in that sense, Ash was helpful in just sort of like helping us navigate through this sort of like talent agency world, you know, in how you like talk to those people and going through the back door when necessary and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think I think with 1985, the future, it definitely became more than what I thought it was going to be, just in the sense that. I didn't think anyone was going to watch that movie. And, and, and I mean, in, in some ways, a lot of people still haven't seen the movie. But whoever has seen the movie and the, the level of press that we have gotten for the film is way beyond my expectations. You know, I mean, this idea that it's like a New York Times critic, critic's pick and, you know, I was an out 100 because of the movie and all this kind of stuff was completely like, like way more than I, what, what I thought the, the movie could do. Has all that made your career in this last movie any easier? Uh, in some ways, yeah, I think so. I think it sort of helped because I think I think with the perception of Pit Stop in some ways is is uh, bigger than the perception for Pit Stop. You know, even though you know it's like it's like nineteen eighty five premiere premiere at South by Southwest, and and then I think I think the sort of like we 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 got like really great reviews and. There was all of like raves and, and all that kind of stuff. And the conversations that came out from the movie was definitely like completely like kind of like blindsided me in a way where it was like, oh, people still care about the subject matter. I mean, that was very, that was very um, surprising, but it was also kind of like nice to know that, oh, this one actually connected in, in, in some, some ways that I never thought was possible. And do you feel that the environment we're in now, which is much more friendly, mm -hmm. uh, is that, is it, are they rediscovering or is that film helping you in this new environment? You know how you were yeah. say, saying, I'm a piece of shit. Are you feeling yeah. less like a piece of shit? I mean, I still feel like a piece of shit in some ways. <laughs> it's probably like, it's just like from big turd to smaller turd <laughs> sort of progression, you know? I mean, it's like, I mean, like, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of OG that you were doing. Yeah. You're doing what people are trying to do yeah. now, and it's okay, yeah. right? We're telling the, the, these yeah. stories now, yeah. and, and 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 it's great. But you were doing it when it wasn't in, right. you know. Yeah. But you know, it's like it, it's 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 it, it remains. It, it it's ultimately still kind of like um, sort of what's the word? Like, like I mean, just... fucking punk rock, dude. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, with the last film, right? The, the 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 film I just finished shooting. You know, I mean, I, I sort of realized this idea that people are just going to be people, you know, which is the <laughs> sense of like, like with this last film, it was, it was very uh, intentional in terms of the kind of cast and the kind of uh, actors we, we want for this film. Right. And so it's like, we're going for something more specifically sort of, um, you know, Asian American for this one. And I sort of realized now we're in this moment of like Asian American talents and stories are, more meaningful to a lot of people, both also financially, also ultimately, so it's the determining thing. It's 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 more meaningful. 
But that also means like just because you're another Asian American director who's trying to tell another Asian American story in today's climate, it means you're gonna have an easier time because ultimately the thing that rules like who's gonna come on board to your movie is still like, well, how much are you gonna pay us? What kind of deal are we getting? And is this ultimately a good enough deal for us to, you know, commit ourselves to it? You know, because I think that is still, I mean, it's, it's very, it's very sort of sobering in that sense that, you know, with this last film, even though I have had a lot of very meaningful, <laughs> um, now Zoom conversations with actors who want to come on board, ultimately they bail because they're juggling, it's like, it's like, Oh, another Yen Ten indie or a Netflix thing or a Marvel thing or a Disney thing or whatever. And it's like we get a more prominent part in this indie and it's a role that we don't usually get to do, but we would rather hang out on a Marvel set for like <laughs> eight months doing this bit part because Marvel is paying us for mm. that whole duration. And I don't want to do Yen's movie for a month even though it's probably more fulfilling for them. Does that make sense? It, it, it becomes it totally this thing where it's sense. like they're going to yeah. pick the thing. But also, too, it's maybe not even so much ego as it is. Yeah. It depends on where they are right. in their right. life. Exactly. Whereas like that Marvel residual will sustain them right. yeah. and right. pay for their and, child and to go to school me, or whatever. More people then, see me right. on, even though I have, you know, a 10-minute scene in the entire film, more people see me in that than in this indie where I'm in it for, you know, 90 minutes or whatever. You know? That's true. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know if as an actor, if that matters so much anymore. Yeah. I think you can be seen by millions of people for right. 10 minutes and then right. still not have the next job exactly. or exactly. a career. Right. Yeah. Right. However, those right. residuals, yeah. like I was saying, right. that's the, that's they exactly will sustain yeah. you right. in the in-between. Well, and, and everyone around them your mortgage. Is, is going, do the Marvel, man. Do right. the Marvel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, no, totally, totally. And, you know, again, it's like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't blame the people who pull out either right. because it's kind of like, well, that's just how it is. I get it, you know. You're saying you would pull out for Marvel from your movie if you got offered a Marvel. Yeah. I mean, I don't know <laughs> yeah. per se because I, I'm not in that. Uh, I've never been in that position of have being able to consider it in that way, you know. But I, I recognize it's a very human nature to, to do. Hence, yeah. what I said, people are going to be people, you like, know, regardless yeah, of all I'm this gonna, conversations about. I'm going to cast you as the first Asian superhero. In this movie, you're gonna be like, okay, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> I only say five things. Yeah, yeah. Only say. That's but fine. you know, I mean, it's it's kind of like I I I I I understand why why they have to do that because ultimately, again, it's a it's a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ultimately, it's a yeah. business. <laughs> I mean, yeah, especially yeah. if there are teams looking at the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So was there any? Was it drastically different? Uh, the film you just mm -hmm. made, the casting process as to um, 1985 or? I think it was a combination of both. I think it was a combination of um, going out to people, you know, offers and auditioning, you know. So it was it was it was sort of nice in to to have it both ways, you know, and and I honestly really loved the audition part in despite it was all like just watching tapes and it was all like virtual callbacks. But again, it was very surprising to see some of the people who actually put themselves on tape for us. You know, there were definitely people that I was like, why is this person putting themselves on tape? Like a bigger name. Yes, like a bigger name that I'm like, this is crazy, right? Like that right. <laughs> they just put themselves on tape for this. Yeah. M meanwhile, I'm thinking they just did. They were in this big thing. Like, why are they? In, why are they doing this? You know. Why do you think? They, why do you think they did it? I think some actors again are very more diligent about that kind of shit. Where they're not just he, just hearing things from their reps. So they're still literally looking at what 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 projects are out there that they're taking submissions for. I think I think these people actually look it up themselves and then pursue the roles for themselves. And do you think that, like, because they're artists, they want to uh, be a part of the, the audition process? Or do you think that, like, like why why, why not call their agent and just say, hey, can you see if I can get a meeting with this guy? I but, mean, I think, I have a feeling because they, they probably like doing it. Yeah. And it's not that thing where, and again, this is like 
I'm sure like case by case, but I have a feeling some actors actually genuinely and uh, like like auditioning, and it's just like this is another way for me to practice my craft. So no mm-hmm. big deal if I get it or not get it. The whole thing is not about me not getting the part. The whole thing is like I I I want to spend some time on this, or I like the material enough. I want to spend some time on it. I want to read for it. And you would know? you say that those actors that they're bigger names, mm-hmm. right? That's who you're talking about, mm-hmm. and so they probably have the financial stability to just be actors. Absolutely. And yeah. so that's when there's like, mm-hmm. it's still enjoyable to yeah. mm-hmm. create a character and right. fool around with it on camera. And yeah, exactly. But also, you know, the funny thing is that even with those actors, like who re- who put themselves on tape for, for the film, like even if I like what they did, the other thing that is part of the consideration on whether we can actually pursue it with them is ultimately... We, you know, sometimes our producers already know who their reps are and we're like, we shouldn't engage because the reps are, you know, assholes, whatever. And, right. Oh. And considering that we have to cast these parts in a given timeline, the negotiation process is going to drag this shit out for so long that if at the end we don't get the actor, we're going to be in a bad place. Well, that's the and other thing in that process schedule. is the reps and the lawyers can yeah. can can botch a deal. Just They by, can totally botch mm-hmm. a deal. Yeah. They can, and, and we were definitely in... Certain even if the actor wants it, like right? Yeah. They can watch even the, the actor wants it, there's a lot of things that they could say that could influence the actor to eventually bail. Yeah. You know, and so sometimes we just have to preemptively shoot that name down, even though we like the audition, because we know that negotiation is not going to turn out well. Wow. Yeah. That that. <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah. when you know you're in yeah. indie and you know your leverage is only up to a certain point. You cannot put yourselves in a position where the, the 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 actors people have an upper hand on how how their deal is going to be shaped. Right. You know. So. But yeah. don't you think them putting themselves on tape? It's you're it almost instantly like, well, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like this guy kind of that he would yeah. he would he would do this, right? I mean, yeah. Even I mean, that's a sad part of it. Like, I I even even if I like it, I don't even you know. And then it's like between the advice of my producers and the casting director. I'm still kind of like, we cannot even do callbacks with them. And they're like, no, don't. Mm. Unless you really believe this person is the only person for the part, like, don't don't engage because it's you, you're just like setting yourself up for a heartbreak. Have basically. you ever felt that? That a particular person was the only person for a no. part? Yeah. No. I mean, it's kind of like in this case, you know, the names are definitely appealing in the sense that, oh, this could elevate our production. But then we're talking about like, there's at least eight auditions that I want to do callbacks with. And the other ones are all like great, even if they're not names. <laughs> yeah. How if like in 1985 did, you know, representation as far as like uh, homosexuality mm-hmm. or ethnicity, did that come into play at all for you in your casting decisions? Like mm-hmm. Jamie Chung, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I could easily see her breakdown being a white woman. Right. Small town. That's what happened. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So it's like, yeah. did you just see Jamie Chung or were you like, here's an I mean, opportunity it was, it was, where I can was, cast an Asian American actress? It was written for an Asian American. It was always written for an Asian American on page. And I just remember all the the breakdowns we got from agencies were like, there was like barely any Asian names. It was like white names, a lot of white names. Even though it said Asian American in the Asian breakdown. American. Because the problem is <laughs> they that probably at that didn't time, have those yeah, actors. Because they didn't have any in their roster right. in... This is, uh, again, not that long ago. This was like 2016. Right. right. They didn't even have enough Asian actresses in their roster. Wow. At that time. Yeah. And so then... I mean, it's good to see, too, how fast things can change. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know? exactly. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. when you talk about it, it feels like prohibition era. <laughs> <laughs> Lifetimes yeah. ago. Like yeah. exactly. <laughs> I remember the 80s. Back I know, in no. the day. That's why it's like, yeah, this was just a few years ago. It's not long that long ago. But yeah. Uh, so... When, so when you do go through the audition process, people, I want to I want to learn a little bit more about how you make your decision mm-hmm. or, or how tough that decision is, and, and like what you could, I guess, advice to actors and yeah. and in that process, you know, that could help them, and and how you, you know, get to a place where you're like, all right, let's go with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, this is probably something that all actors face, and. They are aware of it, but there's actually very little to, to little they can do about it. Which is, the your scene partner can totally fuck up your audition. Yeah, 
And like, even though they're off camera, like there are, there are some auditions that I have to try so hard to tune out the scene partners and just be like, they're good, right? They're good, right? Like just watching the actors themselves. And then the scene partner sometimes just like throw it throw it off so much that you're kind of like, you know, maybe that was not a good addition. Uh oh. So I think that's super important. One thing they can control. Yeah, yeah, that's something you can control. And I know it's probably hard. Sort right? of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> right. I mean, but yeah. My husband's done a lot of reads in the last couple of years. <laughs> maybe I should fire. But him. again, it's not that the scene partners have to be a performer. The scene actor needs to be sort of like operating on this neutral ground yeah. where they're not coloring your performance. Right. Almost um, drown out. Like you can't even, you just monotone can't hear them. It's almost, yeah, yeah it's yeah. almost like very, it's, it has to be very much in the background. Darren, and, you're rehired. And not doing any sort of dramatic <laughs> interpre interpretations so that you can actually just watch the person on camera. Yeah. You know? And I know it's a tall order, but I feel like, oh yeah, that's a thing. Because because from, from the last batch of editions I saw, I was like, who are these people? Who are we? No, I that's a <laughs> that's a very helpful perspective right. yeah. because right. I think that's a shift since we've started doing mostly, yeah, if exactly. not all, yeah. taped auditions. Right. Whereas like and that's a it's a it's a big new burden for mm -hmm. actors to carry because we have to become small filmmakers immediately yeah. in our room, you know, where we have to light and we have to sound and we have to edit and we yeah. have to find a reader and right. we have to, I have to like, you know, stack stuffed animals yeah. to be my stand-in so I can mm -hmm. get a focus or all of that. It's yeah. overwhelming. Yeah. And to find a reader can be really difficult. But, yeah. you know, back in the day, all we did was focus on our performance. Mm -hmm. We went to a place and they had a reader mm -hmm. and whoever it was was whoever it was. And the caution was actually to us of like, mm -hmm. They're probably gonna suck. Don't rely on the reader being good. Create right. whoever. Most of the time, need. the reader was very like monotone. Like yeah. they didn't right. give anything, or yeah. just terribly, terribly, <laughs> just rude uh -huh, in uh -huh. their reading, almost right. Yeah, yeah, and no, so, totally, right, right. We had no control over that, but yeah. that's in, that's really helpful that you're saying. You know, now this is kind of another thing I'm saying where we have to make these tapes, and mm. these tapes are like our one thing because if it doesn't nail it perfectly that time, I feel like it's so easy for you to just go down to the next mm -hmm. one. Next, next, mm -hmm. next, next, I also next. think it's really funny. We're asking you to come and do something that you're not actually going to do. We're mm -hmm. basing right. hiring you off right. of something. We're, we, what you're going to do is end up in a dance yeah. and a communication with right. somebody, but we want you to keep that refrain to just your mind and just in, in just yeah. your sort of idea and play off of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. It's always been. Yeah. But always, but even especially now, it's like, I think it's actually, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, it seems like it's actually going to be more beneficial for us now to make a hard choice mm -hmm. and just present that. Mm -hmm. Whereas back in the day, we were always counseled. Don't come in with a fully formed thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you still want to be workable because sometimes if you come in and you present it this certain way, they think that's the only way that you can do it because you've made such a strong, mm -hmm. you've already, like, this is the last day on set and you have, like, that character's form. As opposed to like a director could maybe see some spaces in between where they can go, okay, well, let's shift and tweak and work around it. We don't have that dance anymore in the right, audition. Right. Exactly, yeah. I mean, you get it. I mean, I got to do that in the callbacks, but not in the very first round of auditions, you know. But you did it virtually over spotty mm -hmm. Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over over, over, <laughs> over Zoom when yeah. we do the callbacks for this last movie. And it was just like, just telling them to read it differently or try to do it different ways and you can sort of see the yeah, versatility in that way, you know? I wish I could describe effectively and maybe by the end of, of something in this lifetime I'll be able to, but the, the str maybe you feel it in just a Zoom meeting. The bizarre vacuum of an environment that you're actually in mm -hmm. when you're doing a Zoom callback, yeah. it's just one of the hardest things yeah. I've ever had to work with. Mm -hmm. I, also, I think for me the hardest was when I got my call back and then they're like okay this is your husband and we don't know each other and now they're seeing split screen i don't see this person but i'm trying to create this relationship with what? this person yeah they'll, they'll, because they'll, i i've they've had, auditioned two actors at the same time together? yeah because yeah, visually it looks fine but mm -hmm. i kind of try to explain to people i go it's but it's so bizarre for them because That's we're still in our so personal space weird. yeah and i i know for a fact i had what you said this actor who was playing my husband was mm -hmm. so thrown off and he was a new actor and I'm not. Yeah. 
and he kept stopping because he's like, I'm sorry, this is my first time. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, God, we're not going to get this. In my yeah, head, yeah, I knew yeah, we weren't going to yeah, get it, right, right? right? He was so uncomfortable. Right. You know, because there's so if many. He's in the room right in front of you. It would have, I think, you it can look him in the eye right. and you yes. can make him stop. He kept asking, Where am I <laughs> supposed to look? Yeah, yeah. You know, right and the casting director is like, Stop. You should know this. There's your camera. There's your eye yeah, line. Yeah. She's looking at the camera, which is oh looking at you. God. You're, you know, and it's like, back to what you're saying. Like, for me, I feel like the virtual has kind of been a two sided coin, yeah, right? Because, yeah. like, the, the opportunity that was given to us to have mm. a wider opportunity. I was like, This is great. <laughs> it's like a weird art project. Right. Yeah. Well, and but back then, in the day, I used to relish the opportunity to stand out because no. ta- tapes were not a regular thing. And so I would take mine a little bit above and beyond mm-hmm. because, like, I always felt like it was such a hindrance to be told, you know, to stand in front of this gray thing on mm-hmm. this one line and you can't really move. And then you read with the reader. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, but I'm eating a bowl of soup. Oh. I'm not going to mime eating a bowl of soup. Right. That's like, it, right. but that adds an element to this scene. It does. It has to do with yeah. the soup, mm-hmm. you know? And then, so when I was self tape, I was like, I'm going to get some fucking soup. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to set a table. Yeah. If and it's, I'm going to yeah, eat the soup. If it's just on a phone, if it's just on a phone, get, do it on, with an get actual on a phone. phone or so forth. Yeah, totally. It, it, it helps. It, it because helps it does yeah. color the way that right. you say things, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And like thing. not doing like full on dress for mm-hmm. auditions, but I tend to. If I'm going to be going out for something that takes place in the 1800s, yeah. right. I'm not going to wear jeans. Right, exactly. I'm just not. I'm does gonna... that make a big difference to you that people? It hint, does. Hint? It totally does. Yeah. You know, I mean, the other thing I also noticed from uh, these auditions that I think is actually helpful, even though I, I think maybe there's different, you know, opinions about this, but for me, I I found it helpful, which is actors who uh, do two different versions of the audition. You, they would do it in one version and then they would do another version that's like different from the first right. version and you get actually get to see it in both ways. And that was helpful in the sense that then you kind of know that there's a range you can play with. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, oh, okay, maybe even if it's not completely right, it's like you can sort of know they can get there right? with your help. Yeah. I always submit to. Okay, good. I yeah. and, and they have the ability to make choices. Like yeah. they, right. And they can commit to those choices. Yeah. And so you feel like there's a dialogue that could happen mm-hmm. where you could get them to where you need them to go. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. I think that's helpful. Yeah. Yes. Um, so when you do make your decision, what informs your decision? Is it just like, because you said that multiple mm-hmm. people could play a role. No. So how do you come to your I mean, I think we, we do the callbacks, you know, and then I narrow it down to, you know, usually like two or three that I feel very strongly about. Then it's a conversation with the producers to see what they think about the shortlist and also the casting director who can be very informative in terms of like, okay, what is it that ultimately you feel, you know, who's actually right for the part and them also. And oftentimes we know these people, right? Exactly. We've worked with them. Yeah, Yeah. you can offer some sense of like, this person is going to be great or this person is going to be so-and-so on the set. Uh, and that that also helps me arrive at the decision, you know. I mean, I think I think, and I'm assuming it's the same way for you, John. Where it's kind of like, like I'm very I'm very upfront about just like, don't let anyone weird or difficult read for this. So just filter that out immediately. I don't care if they're. Good I would or say right. that, or I would. If they're that good, because there are some people that are that good, mm-hmm. but I I will let you know. I'm like. He's difficult, but man, right, he's right, so, right. Good. so good. Yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I have a different rule about that now, where it's like, I I don't want to know about it. Yeah, I don't even want to look at the edition. I don't want them to read for it if they just are like because I feel like, again, it's like there's so many actors who could be right for the part. Like, why make it harder why, on yourself? Right, because why? it's like making a film is so freaking hard already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Don't just bring some, you know person into the set where it could potentially cause trouble and yeah. whatever you know because i know i know by now it's like that's all you need like one 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 back because it this sounds like this is just, coming from experience don't it comes mm-hmm. from experience mm-hmm. you yes, jumped yes, in the hot yeah, tub yeah yeah I've, <laughs> you I, dove I in the hot tub i still have ptsd from it so i'm kind of like <laughs> yeah. yeah don't go through that again yeah it's not worth it yeah <laughs> yeah did you ever have anyone that you ultimately chose that maybe later you were like oh. I still wish I had chosen the other person or they didn't do as good a job as I thought they were going to or I don't know that's really I kind of don't let myself go there I don't know whether that's good or bad meaning I don't let myself regret when this decision is made you know I don't I don't go down the sense of like oh I should have oh, I should have cast the other person 
I think I, I just want to go with that. If you if you if you decide, just just go through with it and and live with that decision, whether whether it's a mistake or not. You can't repaint the room, right? right. You can't yeah. repaint the room. That's it's good advice. Yeah, yeah. Right. I'm just like whatever, move on. <laughs> but do you know it like day one, and then you're like, I'm just gonna have to work with this. <laughs> I'm gonna have I to work harder. I haven't had it like that when yeah. it's like, oh crap, yeah, what a, this, this is going down. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. N- not yet, thankfully. Yeah. Uh, when you're talking about performance, you're like, we can cut away there. We can cut away there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, I think, but I think if it's like that, where sometimes sometimes they're not quite up to snuff, then you think about how you pr- approach it production wise. That's so also that hard on the local. Your, uh, when you when you're bringing local mm-hmm. people in to work with like bigger names, yeah. and, and and it's hard on on the local level with yeah. the actors because they've like they're coming in to work with Al Pacino or right, they're coming, right. you know, and it's it's it, there's a factor there. It's really hard. I mean, and I think it's really on the director to make this person comfortable, get the mm-hmm. performance out of. I mean, I find that like difficult sometimes. Like you, you, the person's great, and they may only have a couple of lines, but they're just so inexperienced. Yeah. That once you get them on set, it gets difficult. Right. 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 Have you ever seen a role that you wrote or were casting for completely change in the course of, I know, like, for example, I auditioned for something, I brought something in, and then they cut that part or didn't want me for that part. So I read for something else, mm-hmm. which I booked. Then in the course of production or pre-production anyway, for the makeup test and whatnot, I was shown materials to help my char- understand my character more. This is where they come from. This is mm-hmm. what we're going for. And then the makeup changed, mm-hmm. and then the wardrobe changed mm-hmm. considerably yep. from the world I thought we were living mm-hmm. in. And so by the end of it, it was, and these were all decisions made mm-hmm. along the way by the director. Mm-hmm. So it was sort of like by the end of it, I, the character was v- incredibly different from not only what right. I brought in, but what I thought was on the page. Right. Have you ever had a character flesh out so differently by the end of a thing? I mean, not not like drastically, you know, but definitely it uh, it, it it always ends up not qu- qu- being quite what you thought it was gonna be, you know. Yeah. And I I don't I don't see that as a negative thing because I think most of the time, that is just the nature of collaboration, you know. And and honestly, it's still fun in a way mm-hmm. to see how it ends up being because I think most of the time, I mean, for me, it's like most of the time I'm pleasantly surprised how it overall becomes more interesting or deeper or you know or have, and so having forth. having an actor bring something mm-hmm. right that you because I, I remember having an audition and then the director goes oh I loved your audition so much no. I rewrote it yeah to fit what you did right 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 and I was like oh yeah. right like I didn't expect that. Or, or, or I mean I I think I think that's definitely one thing but the other thing for me is like always like like you know I I I I I I stress out about my dialogue quite a bit because I'm ESL and I think that's a part of me that's kind of like, you know, the easiest way for people to tell that you're not like an American <laughs> filmmaker is the way you botch your dialogue. So be careful. So I'm always like wanting the actors to just tell mm. me if the lines don't sound natural to you to just like do it in a way that sounds better to you. But I'm always constantly surprised by lines that I wrote that I'm just a bit like, oh, this scene is might be a bit bumpy. Let's see how they do the lines. And then they do the lines the way it's written. And it's like, oh, oh. this is yeah. great. <laughs> I'm not insecure anymore right. about yeah. this. That's when I'm like, you're really good. <laughs> <laughs> you're really good that you you sort of fix what I thought was bad writing into something that sounds completely realistic and plausible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do your parents think of this as a career now? <laughs> I think they're okay with it. Yeah. <laughs> Still a little bit ambivalent in the sense that they don't really understand what it is. Still. Which which I don't blame them. Yeah. But you know, and but I think I think, you know, like and, and I'm I'm thankful that they're not the kind of parents who are kinda of like, you should do something else. Because you know, like going back to Ang Lee, I remember even Ang Lee when he went back to uh Taiwan for like the premiere of Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon at that point in his career. His dad was still like, when are you going to get a real job? Oh, gosh. Like, they're not like that. They're not that bad, you know. Yeah. But but I think I think for them, they're, they're, they're hoping that I would still find my way into it. That it's like, oh, this is like finally you you got there, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I feel like I got there already. I just, I'm just not getting there in a way where, like, 
they can be like, you should watch the next Marvel. Our son directed it. It's not like that. Right. You know, they're like, don't watch the, his movies because then you're going to find out he's gay. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think they're okay with it at this point. Are you okay with it? You're going to keep doing it? I mean, is there a choice? <laughs> right. After a certain age, you can't be like, I'm quitting this. It's like you're too far in. What are you going to do? Not do it? <laughs> yeah. I think that goes, I mean, that, that's the same thing for our actors. Only. After a certain point, it's like you're, you're in too deep. You might as well just continue doing it and, and find a way to sort of accept this is, this is, if this is the best it's going to be, are you okay with it? That's a question I always ask myself. Yeah. And, and I, I sort of, I was, I, I managed to answer it a couple of years ago. Well, I was like, if this is, this is the best it is. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm okay with it because I consider myself very lucky. I got to even to do it on this on, to this extent, you know. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to not do it at all is the saddest thing of all, honestly. Right. To know that you you you're into this thing and you have to keep yourself from pursuing it because you don't think it's economically viable, whatever, and to not give it a shot at all, that's the saddest thing. Right. When it's a part of you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, and now it's available to, I mean, we have the tools. Like mm -hmm. back when we just got digital cameras, it was just so, it, that was the exactly. first. Like, oh my God, I can actually make something. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's obtainable. Yeah. Um, I think I just want to ask, I guess we're, we're going to be wrapping up. I want to just say mm -hmm. advice that you could give to actors or in yeah. the process or what you think or how you could help, help people. Have better taste. No, that's not so <laughs> You're like, cultivate your taste. Read a book. <laughs> read more. I mean, I think, you know, again, it's kind of like, I, I feel like it's a combination of, yeah, I mean, definitely consume things, you know, whether it's books or watch more movies, watch, make an attempt in really exploring world cinema, you know, and see what is done outside of America and all that kind of stuff. Um you know, listen, try to listen to good music. Uh, yes. I don't know. I mean, that that helps, but also I don't want to be like, I mean, I listen to both. I listen to bad music, music intentionally because I genuinely enjoy them to a certain level. Um, but I think ultimately your experience, your life, the way you sort of filter your experience into your art is 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 is, is, is kind of like the, the biggest thing. You know, it's kind of like if you sort of see, I don't know. I, I always look at this idea of like when you have setbacks and we have to go through a lot of hard, hardship in your life. In a way, that's kind of a gift as an artist because you can, you can translate that into something else. You know, you can translate that into your performance or, and so forth. And I think that's, that's like, you know, that's like a gift for us, you know, to be able to sort of, process our shit through something into something else and and turn into something else and then share that with 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 other people like that's that's like great you know so so sort of think about it that way i guess <laughs> you're a filter for these words yeah that filter needs to be rich right right yeah right yeah so yeah and stop reading with bad people Huh? Stop reading with bad people. <laughs> Get good readers. Right, reading, Get yeah. good readers. But also, I think, I think also, like, I mean, I, I think, I, 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 as, as a filmmaker, I believe in this idea of who your community is, and I, I would say it's probably the same thing for actors. You know, you kind of have to surround yourself with people who love and respect you. You know, the kind of work you're doing and the kind of person you are, and 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 not just be in that sort of bad environment where. You're just around people who are competing with you who don't want you to do well, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that's something that can happen to a lot of people. I, I imagine in 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 within actors, it's probably mm -hmm. in some ways like more more competitive and more severe than what filmmakers go through. So yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you, Yen Tan. Thank you, Thank you for being thanks, in the John. room thanks, with thanks, us. Kendra. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. Thanks for having me in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Now let's get out of the room. <laughs> <laughs>